Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this event as part of the Art History Festival, Art and Medicine in Conversation. I'm Katie Barrett. I'm curator of art collections at the Science Museum in London. I'm speaking to you from there this evening. And I'm really delighted to be joined in this event by artist Eleanor Crook, who you can also see on your screen, uh, speaking to you from her wonderful studio um, in the wilds of Berkshire, um, which I'm lucky to have visited in the past. And um, welcome to the festival if this is your first event. And uh, we should start off by saying thank you to the Association for Art History for inviting us to take part in this event. It's a great delight um, to have a conversation with Eleanor in this context. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Please do um, type in questions as we go. We'll do a Q&A session at the end. Um, you can enter questions in the box at the bottom of your screens. Uh, but if, as Eleanor and I are in conversation, if one of your questions strikes me, I might loop it in um, as we go. But we will have some designated time at the end as well. And for anyone who needs closed captioning, similarly, there is a button at the bottom of your screen to turn that on. So please do make the most of that. Um, Eleanor and I will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end, finishing up at five to seven um, in time for you to head off to another event, should you so wish. So Eleanor, can I invite you to share your screen and say hello to our lovely audience? There, is that visible to everyone? Perfect, yes. Well, hello Katie and hello to the Association for Art History and hello to everyone who's in the audience who are virtually with me in this wooden shed in Berkshire where I make everything. It's very nice to see everyone and thanks for coming out to talk about art and medicine. Um, Katie and I will be discussing partly this commission here. I know Katie's got a bunch of uh, questions to ask me. Um, and because of the nature of my work, where I would normally at the start of a talk give what the old rhetoric schools would call a captatio benevolentiae, which is where you seize the benevolence of your audience by some likable, unaccustomed as I am, or something like that. In this situation, I'm not going to give that. I'm going to give you instead a bit of a sensitive content warning. Um, I'm involved with making models of surgery and anatomy. I'm involved as a medical artist in working with, you know, real human dissections and talking about injuries and illness just as part of what I do and also as part of artworks. And uh, some of the pictures I'm going to be showing you are, are quite confronting and I'll try to warn you before I show a particularly confronting one each time. And uh, I have a list of trigger warnings for you here. I can't completely promise to catch every one of them. So just a little um, sensitive content warning before I begin. Is that okay, Katie? Thank you, Eleanor. Yes, so please, if anyone um, feels they don't want to um, stay part of the event, please, we won't be offended if you wish to leave. Um, could you go on to your next slide, Eleanor? So just to start by giving you a, a very quick introduction as to uh, how Eleanor and I know each other and why we are here. And it's because we worked together on a suite of new galleries at Science Museum, which opened in November 2019. So almost two years ago now, which is extraordinary that we've reached that point already. Um, and they are called Medicine, the Welcome Galleries. And it's a suite of five galleries on the first floor of the museum, largest curatorial project the museum has ever undertaken, which look at um, the history of medicine, contemporary medicine, through various themes, and include five uh, major art commissions where we worked with a number of artists. Um, I, as curator, works, um, work with the artists to develop their commissions for the galleries. And Eleanor and I, in particular, worked on one gallery, if you could go to your next slide, Eleanor, called Faith, Hope and Fear Gallery. And this is at the um, west end of the suite of galleries. And you can see Eleanor's wonder, wonderful commission here, um, looking down into our Making the Modern World gallery on the ground floor. And Faith, Hope and Fear is a gallery which looks at all the things that we bring into our ideas of medicine that we might maybe not think of as medical. And we'll come on to that in our discussion, I'm sure. Um, and we set Eleanor the very, I think, incredibly difficult brief, which she met beautifully, of um, helping create a space for people to think about death which is obviously a very important aspect of how we might think about medicine 
but not an easy subject to discuss. And um, Eleanor and I worked together for two and a half, three years um, as the galleries developed um, and as Eleanor developed her commission and um, had a number of really wonderful conversations about the work and its progress and um, making as we went along and thought this um, festival was a wonderful opportunity for you to be part of that conversation. So I've got a few questions that I'm going to ask Eleanor to um, respond to, um, riffing off some of the things we've discussed in the past and I know we've got a wonderful set of images to work our way through as well. So Eleanor, I think let's start off if you could tell us a, a bit about your work and your background really. So what led you to being an artist? How did you get into this particular field? Well, I surprise you to know I was not going to do art at all when I was a young person and I actually went to university to do ancient languages and archaeology. Um, and two things happened that steered me away, I suppose, from becoming an ancient art historian or an academic. Um, the first thing that happened was I got very, very interested in ancient Greek sculptures, both as formal aesthetic beautiful objects but also as time travels you know I realized there were these strange things that had a life and a purpose in their period and then they were often long buried unearthed and they still could communicate pretty vibrantly and eloquently with people from a completely different time and place so I found that you know something to aspire to to be able to communicate something through objects that for that long um, and the other thing, I had a good old fashioned uh, calling all of a sudden whilst walking near Hadrian's Wall to be a sculptor. It sounds romantic now to repeat it, but it was true. I suddenly realised without any hesitation that sculpture was my job and I had to learn to do it sort of from the ground up. Um, I knew it would cause trouble. It caused trouble within the family. It was a difficult path to follow when you're already going down another route. But uh, I don't regret it. I think I sort of had no choice. You just, if you get a calling like that, all of a sudden, out of a clear sky, you have to follow it. So when I'd finished doing classics and archaeology, I applied to the big London art schools and ended up at Central St. Martins in 1989 which was a very liberating and interesting experience. Funnily enough, although I had this ambition to make statues, figurative sculpture was completely off the menu for art historical reasons. And also I think sort of heroic figurative sculpture was still a bit discredited from its associations with some of the 20th century's totalitarian regimes. So nobody was really working on it or teaching it at that art school. I wanted to know about it, so I started going to museums to find out about it and started picking up with medical museums, begged my way onto the anatomy course at the Slade School of Art, where they still do drawing and human dissection uh, with University College Hospital dissection department, and started to learn the body almost as an alternative to what was being taught in the art school. What they did teach in the art school that was very, very useful were you know, the real foundations of sculpture, materials, scale, the sort of the emotional temperature of different materials, handling, how to deal with a space, how to, you know, hold a gallery. Um, so between these two, um, between these two uh, places to learn things, I started to put together what I'm doing now. So right back, I should have given you a trigger warning before that, I apologise, my system of red lines isn't working. I started to work at the medical museums in London and started to work at the uh, Gordon Museum of Pathology doing drawings and making models. And trigger warning, there are some pictures here of wax models of anatomy. The Gordon Museum of Pathology is at Guy's Hospital. It's a you know, very interesting subterranean space that's mainly open only to the medical public. And it has an amazing collection of 19th century wax models by Joseph Town, which are easily and far away good enough to learn your anatomy from. Um, and I became very curious about how these were made, started running loads of experiments on materials, colours, casting, modelling and making things on the spot. Um, and slowly learning, it's like a sort of backwards engineering, sort of backwards archaeology, slowly learning how these things were made. 
Um, and from working there, uh, I've sort of taken this wax modeling and anatomy practice around Europe, working in the back rooms, both learning from the old wax models that exist in collections all over the place. Some of them are in our welcome galleries of medicine at Science Museum. You can see some beautiful examples there. Um, partly learning from them and partly learning how to repair them, which has become a branch of what I do. So I spent a good long time looking at some of these um, interestingly aestheticized anatomies by late 18th century Italian modelers like Clemente Susini. The place to really see these is in Florence or uh, Vienna. There's another collection of his or Cagliari in Sardinia has another great collection. So these are the sort of back rooms I've been working in. And my sort of interests in the figure, in statuary and in anatomy and medicine really all came together almost by accident. I thought I was going to become a portrait artist, having a sort of knack for turning a likeness. Um, but I was hanging around these museums and people were starting to ask me if I could make things to exhibit, particularly to fill in gaps in the collection. Um, of medical items that they hadn't had made in the past. And I just started learning how to do it and um, filling in an empty niche. So while I was still a student, I was enjoying making these sort of hoax anatomical and archeological objects. This is a bronze head. Um, it's actually worked up from photographs of a mummified head from uh, one of the Queens in Luxor. Um, and I sort of remade it in wax and then bronze as, a, as an art object, I suppose, but also as a sort of archaeological hoax. And when I look at it now, it could almost be the mummified head of our statue, Santa Medicina. It's a, you can see a bit of continuity there. So this was really right back when I was training. Um, there was a, the next slide is a rather graphic drawing I made in a dissection room but the identity of the donor whose body I was working with to learn my medical drawing skills uh, is disguised. So this is actually the face of a living person, segued on. Um, but I spent a lot of time in the dissection rooms, just drawing, doing rather plain, um, detailed, sort of hard, close observational drawing. Um, just really learning my facts with, you know, three textbooks open all around me and um, the anatomical material to look at in front of me, trying to really learn as much as a lay person can about anatomy just through observation. It's a rather old fashioned way of learning it, but it's slow and um, detailed way of getting there. If you're wondering what this strange object is on this drawing, um, I laid this drawing out overnight for the varnish to dry and um, a spider came along and deposited right next to the breath of the, of the subject, right next to its nostrils, next to its breath. It donated a, a mummified and cocooned uh, moth or insect of some kind and left it on the drawing in this very salient place. So the two things now belong together, this little... Uh, mummified time travel of an insect of an insect now lives on the frame of this thing. So I also started involving uh, personal matters in anatomical study from quite an early point in what I was doing, because, you know, we've all got a body, we all have feelings about a body and we might be intrigued or perhaps terrified or horrified to be made of such animate matter. Uh, this little statue is a portrait that I made of a poet who issued me with a romantic rejection back in the 90s. And um, I was making an anatomical model on the day I received the rejection letter. It was extremely disappointing. And uh, the Freudians amongst you will see that I've projected the feeling of gutted onto the, uh, the disappointing uh, object of affection. But yes, I quickly learned that anatomy can become quite quite personal. So this one, this is an example of some pathology that 
this model now lives, sorry, at the Gordon Museum at Guy's Hospital, along with all the wax models of Joseph Town. And I made it as an example of a disease that Joseph Town wouldn't necessarily have seen and certainly didn't, to our knowledge, sculpt because it was rare in his day. But it's, it's actually bubonic plague, you know, the um, illness caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis that went through uh, Europe in waves, uh, very hard to treat and unavoidably dangerous before antibiotics. Um, the pictures that I used to research this one were from an outbreak in Brazil in 1909, I think, and uh, some more pictures that were from the Vietnam War. There was an outbreak in Vietnam at the time. So this is quite a small model. It's, you know, just somewhat bigger than a Barbie doll. It uh, fills in a gap in the pathology collection at King's. Some of my wax modeling really went towards more just purely aesthetic pieces, really. Some sort of just sort of atmospherics in wax. There's this sort of rather morbid gallery art that I, uh, that I spend a lot of time thinking about and making. Wax is a lovely material for expressing flesh and the sort of fragility uh, of flesh and the way light makes it translucent. And I've spent a lot of time working with wax as a material coming up with different light effects and trying to get the sort of liquidity of real flesh and the liquidity of the surface that you feel yourself to be made of. Rather painterly effects, aren't they? I think I was inspired by that for that one by the, uh, the raft of the Medusa of Jericho, which for which he himself painted a lot of um, body parts from the morgue in Paris. And you've, you've also done a lot of work in bronze, haven't you, Eleanor? I think um, if you want to say a little bit about that, and then we should probably move on to the commission. OK, I will just quickly and with another health warning, pass you through more of the wax medical museum pieces. Um, some dermatology for the Royal College of Physicians. Um, a lot of mended embryology for museums across Europe. Um, some reconstructive plastic surgery for the Hunterian Museum in London and for Guy's Hospital now, more reconstructive plastic surgery and some wax uh, sort of mise-en-scene to commemorate the First World War that I made. But yeah, the bronzes, basically if you're a wax worker, bronze is half a step away. Just like wax, it's also a liquid medium. And the first stage of making a bronze is to do a wax model, really. Some people start with clay and cast that to wax, but every bronze that you see is probably passed through a stage of being a wax model. And that, what I, you know, what I describe of as that rather liquid surface can really be captured in metal. This is an anatomical model, an écorché that I made um, for an exhibition in Ghent. Uh, and it really is the anatomy as best I could describe it, sculpted um, as a medical artist in the dissecting room from the real uh, reference and translated that into bronze as, you know, it's a sort of art historical trope, isn't it? The Eccleshay, but this is one that adopts a lively pose and is actually standing on his own flayed skin like a St. Bartholomew figure. Uh, have a taste, I suppose, for trying to combine, you know, some real, you know, the absolute beauty of the body when you really see it, and particularly that surface just under the skin. It's incredibly beautiful. Trying to combine that with the macabre to get the effect. So yes, let's move on to the commission, Katie. Where shall we begin? So well, you've talked a bit about materials already, and I'm sure you'll you'll talk to us more about that as we go, but. I mean, perhaps it's maybe obvious from what you've said about your background, but what appealed to you about doing a commission like this for some medicine galleries at the Science Museum? Um, yeah, what, what drew you in? Well, I, I knew that the medicine galleries were being redone and I'd visited the, the former ones many times and drawn. And I remember walking up to the wooden hoarding where the new galleries were screened off. You couldn't see what was going on. I remember looking through the peephole and thinking, wow, they're rehousing that collection. How amazing. I wonder if they'd like anything. And then, of course, I 
rather timidly back down and didn't uh, didn't offer or suggest or even put my nose above the parapet. And um, one of the uh, medicine gallery curators, Sarah Bond, very kindly sent me an, inf an invitation. She must have come across my work somewhere. Very kindly sent me an invitation to apply to offer a piece to these galleries. Um, rather amazed to be asked, yeah, very honoured and amazed to be asked. I sat and thought about it, and this the image of this statue that we now have came to me rather strongly and quite fast. I thought, what, you know, it's such an interesting combination of medical history objects, but also, you know, religious objects in the Faith, oh, Hope and Fear really Gallery. Um, and um, it just seemed to bring together all these strands of interest and all these strands of work that I'd done in the past. Um, you sometimes think very, you know, if oh, not God. now, then when to take on a big job like this. So I visited the gallery and thought about the audience and realized how young a lot of the audience are. The brief that I was given was to create a, a sculpture that would introduce the idea of what, of death and a good death uh, to the whole audience. And I thought, well, what does death mean to somebody this big or, you know, to him or to her? It was a sense that it was a, a huge and important topic to have to introduce with the sculptural object. Uh, so it needed to really speak like, you know, clearly and um, not morbidly, really. So my thoughts turned to, you know, where was I when I started to get ideas about death? And actually, it was in museums. So many children, I think, meet their first deceased person as a, as a mummy or as, you know, you know very ancient human remains in a, in a, in a museum. So, yeah very early experiences of death ha happen for a lot of children in a museum. You know, they meet a mummy, they meet one of those um, cast figures from Pompeii. And, you know, the question will must arise into the into their little mind, you know, what's happened here? Well, you know, what is this? Is it a person? It looks like a person. Why isn't it alive? And, in, you know, actually a museum is a very good setting to introduce these thoughts and, and to have these discussions. Um, there's also this sense of longer than your lifespan time that you experience in a museum, but this is where you also encounter ancient ancestors. The Science Museum is where you also think of the future and perhaps the far future, and even geological time and time in space. Um, so all, you know, all the material that you would need for considering these, you know, this big mortality question is on site. Um, thinking about how to approach the commission personally, I did think back to when I was a child and where my first experiences thinking about death were. And it was on actually a family holiday to Innsbruck in Austria, up in the Alps, very beautiful city. Um, I suddenly realized what death was about, looking at some sculptures in a mausoleum. The Hofkirche in Innsbruck is the tomb of Emperor Maximilian I, who died in 1519. He was an emperor who had a strong sense of mortality and designed his own memento mori and traveled with his own coffin and left in his will that he wanted this huge mausoleum with what is now 28, monumental statues in bronze to surround it and something about their stillness, their darkness, their ornateness and this funereal setting of this uh, Hofkirche church brought to my mind, you know, what I would call this tremendous majesty of death. You know, there's a sort of ceremonial beauty about it, but also something very inexorable. Innsbruck is a good place to think about mortal things. This is where they just had the Winter Olympics, uh, where the, uh, the ski jump had this person sliding down a very slippery chute, flying through the air for 10 glorious seconds, face first towards a graveyard, which is, I always think, a very good image for what life is. 
This little yellow building up here is a bronze foundry. And going into this church, this is the Emperor Maximilian, just to give you Dürer's portrait of this extremely morbid emperor. Going back into this mausoleum and looking as a sculptor and an adult at this uh, incredible bronze installation, and knowing that there was a sculpture commission going, I began to think, you know, this, mag this magnificent surface on these models, this, it was possible then, it's possible now, how did they do it? And so part of my project, as well as a, as a relationship with medicine and mortality, part of my project became an art historical one uh, about how these statues were made. And looking at them and really thinking, you slowly realize you're looking at gigantic bronze bells, particularly the female figures with their skirts. And a little bit of snooping around, I found that Innsbruck had a history of bell casting and the foundry that cast some of these. It's not quite still there, but that little yellow building that I showed you, they still make gigantic bells for all over Europe in bronze. And it surprises me that these aren't better known because actually Albrecht Dürer designed several of them. And look, we still have his drawings. Uh, it's just an extraordinary thing and a project, a sort of art historical project that I long for somebody to pick up so I can find out all about it too. So if anybody out there and watching would be interested in a bit of uh, art history with bronze and the Alps, let's talk. And I think you have some images of the of the bell process. Is that right? I and do. Then, um, I do. And then we can maybe actually show show the sculpture itself and talk a bit about yeah. the specifics yeah. of it. So my aim was to combine that effect with, you know, these beautiful Catholic um, ceremonial effects that you get, where light and movement and decoration all combine together to make what I wanted. You know, a patron saint of medicine that would be both somber and festive at the same time. So still and dark, but also highly decorated and beautiful. I produced this little drawing. I like looking back at this because you can see the statue actually was made, even though I don't, hem, let's, let's, not be, uh, let's not beat about the bush. I don't really draw very brilliantly. I sculpt a lot better than I draw. But as my old tutor used to say, you draw it the best you can, just draw it the best you can. So I could see the sculpture, did the drawing, thought about putting all these uh, medical votives all over the skirt and all these amulets that the Science Museum has in its collection and now are in the Faith, Faith Hope and Fear Gallery and went back to the Bell Foundry, asked them for, a, for an in and went and got shown how to do bell casting. And you may think that's a bit of a, a leap, but when you're gonna make a statue that big in bronze, you're making it in clay. And the clay just wants to dry out and crack up from the minute you take it out of the bag. I knew I was going to have a statue on the stand for months on end. And the detail that has to go on, you just wouldn't have the time to make it all in wax. So you'll see how I got around that. And it's the way the bell founders did the same problem. They'd make the huge form of the bell in clay. And then the decorations that go on it are made of wax in little... Well, a potter would call it a sprig mold. It's a little two dimensional mold that you just press the wax into and you can make multiples from it. And then the wax sticks to the clay and you cast the whole thing together with one mold. Saves an awful lot of time and it, it saves the, uh, the clay from cracking up. And it may sound like an odd or a pedantic point, but finding out that technical fact was the only reason I was able to make this thing look the way it looks. So these are the lovely wax things that they make at the bell foundry and apply to the bells for all over Europe. This one was for a cathedral in Romania with a very beloved archbishop had his portrait put onto it. And here is what it looks like when they pour the bells. You, know, you get this real drama of metal casting, which I can wax extremely enthusiastic about. You know, it's dangerous. It looks like space travel. It's um, 
it's really, you know, if you can arrange for yourself to go and attend a bronze tour, it's a very exciting thing to watch. Meanwhile, I wanted the statue to have a reliquary aspect as well. I'm very fond of going to Catholic countries and seeing how they place the saint for veneration on the altar. Often it's a wax saint with that beautiful, rather spiritual looking translucency of the material. And I just kind of wanted to capture some of that effect and put it in London. So I've got form for making these rather delicate looking um, wax, wax portraits or imaginary portraits really that are just hovering on the verge of mortality. And I decided to put one inside our model. There's another one from Padua. Um, and sculpted this really. I kind of like the idea of that uh, contrast between the lastingness of the bronze and what looks like fragility of the wax and the dark weight of the bronze and the lightness of the wax. Um, that little figure is surrounded by a load of fiber optic candles. And he's lying there inside the statue, not sure whether he'll recover or not, but because of the medical profession, feeling cared for all the same. So I suppose the look on his face is comforted and hopeful. Well, this was my intention. So just the process, that's the little maquette. I made a miniature model to show the team to okay the uh, design for the sculpture. Um, certain things changed, certain things didn't. Uh, working out the skirt, there was a sort of bit of unexpected geometry and uh, model making. That was translated by our wonderful foundry sculpture castings of Basingstoke into an armature that I could work over. A uh, real shout out to the foundry who did the most superb work and were so kind and patient with me. And then out came tons and tons of clay and the clay goes on the armature and it gets built. And this was, I suppose, the long, long months of uh, just day and night after day and night modeling this thing while sitting, sitting on the ground doing the details at the bottom in a pile of mud. Uh, I wouldn't have missed it, it was a real experience. Uh, the little um, decorative objects on the skirt of this statue, a lot of them were chosen by people on the Science Museum team and the Foundry team and friends of mine in the medical art world and friends and friends. So a lot of people had a hand in the design and the content of this thing. The process was just to model them in soft wax, take a mould and then press uh, uh, harder wax into it to go onto the model. And we had quite a collection of these objects that were made in the end. Um, our curator of medicine, Natasha McEnroe, asked me to portray the Susini twins to commemorate her own twins in wax there. Um, oh, there are so many of these that belong to various members of the team. I spy a pair of tooth braces, which might belong to a curator of art. Katie there, which was a great idea for an emblem. But yes, really the skirt was covered in these emblems as a way of covering it with the content of the medical profession, I suppose, whilst also keeping this sort of religious votive idea at the forefront. Look, this is from a friend of mine who had a kidney transplant, Bobby Dewsbury, and she now has her two old kidneys, which are small and shrunken, and the new one, which keeps her alive. Oh. There are the teeth. I also traveled out to Phoenix where there's a shrine with a, a statue that receives tributes in the forms of tiny Milagros attached to his blanket uh, as gifts and offerings with safety pins. It's so beautiful and so specific, the pinning. I wanted to capture that for the statue as well. So you'll see that there. And several faces went on and off this thing. You don't always get the face you want the first time. Um, couldn't quite get who I wanted her to be. So I went back to the skull, sculpted a skull and then built into the skull and slowly this sort of personality emerged. Um, this rather thoughtful, but concentrating face because she's shown 
with a scalpel in one hand and a pair of stitching forceps in the other hand. She's actually operating as you see her. And here it is pretty much done in clay with all the wax emblems attached, the nurse's chatelaine. And this old rosary from Lourdes became her stethoscope. In came the boys and covered her with pink rubber to take a huge mold. And for five minutes, she looked truly contemporary. Her hands are cast from the eminent cardiac surgeon, Francis Wells, who's a great friend to medical artists and has collaborated with us on a number of projects. And we made a pair of the hands specially for his art collection as well. There's the Chatelaine being cast. You can see that at the old operating theatre museum in London. Natasha's twins. Sarah Bond, who um, got me involved in this in the first place, had a baby during the time we were making the statue. And um, that's, that's its placenta. So it's immortalized in bronze as well. And this is the hair that stirs the, uh, the elixir of immortality on the moon. We have a, a Netsuke of that in the Science Museum collection. Just a few action shots from the foundry. If you ever want anything cast, these are your guys and girls. And this is the skirt being cast. There's sort of industrial amounts of wax being swished around inside a huge mold. Out it came in green wax. And then I had weeks and weeks of detailing and finishing. Um, and the foundry just did this amazing job. And I. One thing I sort of say is that a lot of artists who do these big commissions have quite a big team. And um, I did have this team at the foundry, but I think it was a bit unusual before then to make something this big sort of all on your own in a shed. And I really felt the sort of weight of physically making this thing and having to decide all the details. Um, but, you know, one step after another. Slowly putting the waxes together and the torso, lots of finishing. Oh, look, there she is, molten. You can see her red hot. And of course, when the pieces come out, it's not finished. Everything looks all cut, cut up and uh, covered in crusty ceramic. And so the guys very expertly reassembled this in bronze um, and, and hid all the joins. It's just an extraordinary technical feat. Uh, Kevin Hutchins at the Foundry did a lot of it, and uh, it was just an awesome thing to watch this thing get rebuilt in metal. I really enjoy patination as a bronze doer, and um, this is where the chemicals get burnt into the surface of the bronze to give you the colours. So there's a sort of alchemy to it, and it's very dramatic. And I sometimes think the shapes of your sculpture never look so beautiful as when there's flames licking all over them. And it's a special thing that only the people at the foundry get to see. So there she is being coloured. And this is what you see now. You know, this is the, the finished, um, finished bronze as it stands in that gallery. Um, sorry, I nearly jumped the gun there. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to see it there. And I do um, encourage everybody to to come and see it in the flesh as it were, or in the bronze and the wax um, at the museum, because we actively encourage visitors to, to touch the sculpture. It's a real kind of tactile as well as a visual treat. And certainly I'm hoping a bit like statues in churches, it will develop its own patina from, from different areas that, that are touched over time. Um, we're gonna have to move to questions in a, in a minute, because as always, we've um, uh, enjoyed talking too much. Um, but perhaps Eleanor, you might just reflect briefly on how you feel now it's on display. I think both perhaps when the gallery's opened and also, of course, it's been a particular kind of interim period for us all in terms of thinking about medicine and our own bodies. Um, so perhaps just for one or two minutes, you'd um, tell us how you feel. Well, from a personal sort of art professional point of view, it really was the job of a lifetime. And when I look at it, I feel really very honoured that it's found that place and very relieved that given that huge responsibility to hold that space and cover that topic, um, 
nothing went too horribly wrong. You know, the, the, I had a real sense of, oh, you know, I'm, I've been a sculptor for a long time, but I've never done anything on this scale before or had these resources to realise something with. Um, and you feel people's hopes are upon you and you feel a, a responsibility also to the materials and the foundry team. You don't want to let anybody down and you really want it to to speak out. And I think I now find it completed when I see people look at it in the gallery. And it hopefully, hopefully does convey some of that sense of, you know, just the amazement of what materials will do. Um, and the presence that a, an old fashioned figurative sculpture can have. You know, you sometimes see children with their fingers on the glass edge or just looking at the little figure inside and they look quite lit up and it's that feeling of amazement that I've had in the past looking at other sculptures that I wanted to grab. Now what happened soon after we opened this uh, exhibition um, nobody really saw coming while we were making it and that of course was the you know the Covid and the lockdowns and the losses and the dreadful hard work and the, uh, you know, the sort of long punishing hours and skin of teeth experiences of medical staff all over the place. And uh, to me, it's, it's given it a, a, a slightly different feeling. Do you remember how we talked about whether or not she should wear a, a mask for a long time and came away deciding that she shouldn't just, just for relatability? And that became, you know, such a key topic thinking about healthcare given that we suddenly had this horrible transmissible illness and so I hope that you know people will now feel that they can look at the statue and she pays some sort of tribute to everybody's hard work and some of the you know horribly difficult situations that people have found themselves in. I hope it will kind of reach forward and, um, and be a marker of that in a way. And the fact that the guy inside it, the little patient surrounded by all his candles, you know, he receives the best of care. And you feel that when you look at the, at the sculpture, there are badges all over his blanket from the NHS, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, a lot of um, medical and philanthropic associations. And uh, really the whole thing was like an old fashioned sculpture, you know, a thank offering to all the people who look after us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it it's a mark of how commissions like this work so well is that they continue to, to change and have different meanings as, as the world changes around them. Um, and certainly I think it it already has in, in, in extraordinary ways. Um, we've already had a few questions come in, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll come to in a minute, but the, the First thing I also wanted to ask you, Eleanor, was you mentioned the idea of responsibility, and we've talked about this in the past a little bit, but do you think there's something particular about working as an artist in a, in a medical context? Is it, is it extra responsibility? I'm sure it's extra inspiring, certainly for you. It is inspiring, very. Um, you have double responsibility, both to the patients and in dissection, you know, to the people who kindly donate their bodies for, for teaching. Um, and for them, you know, that sense of responsibility, actually, I just feel it as gratitude, really, you know, I'm just enormously grateful that people will make that gift and their families will make that gift. Um, and in fact, when I'm teaching, I often teach drawing to medical students and to medical illustrators. And when I'm teaching and I have one of these um, donors in front of me in the dissection room to teach from, I, I tend to use the language like this. I sort of say, look, he's showing you, you know, this structure in his arm, look, he's showing you this organ, she's showing you this structure in her tendons, um, and discuss it as though the, the, the donated body is what they're traditionally called the silent teacher. So there's that responsibility. There's also a responsibility to the real medics who I, you know, learn from and work with occasionally whose work I try to memorialize and make models of for the museums, which is that you very much know that you're an amateur working in a very highly professionalized and knowledgeable area. And uh, 
kind of keeps you humble you know you just realize how much you don't know okay I can talk a little bit about anatomy and sculpt a convincing set of muscles but what I know is just like this tiny tiny layer of icing on a big big cake and uh, I'm I'm fully knowledge fully in the knowledge that my medical knowledge is limited and I just spend my time asking asking researching researching and people have been really generous sort of telling me what i need to know to make this stuff extremely mm -hmm. kind I, it's a, it is a collaboration um but you just have to remember who's done the years of medical training <laughs> <laughs> but you've also done the the artistic training and i think it is it's when that relationship really comes comes together isn't it yeah um in fact so uh we've had um some nice comments from uh, Monica saying how, how gorgeous the work is. Um, I've had a question from Barbara for the, the name of the foundry, and I think it's Sculpture Castings Basingstoke. Sculpture Castings right? Basingstoke. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to go at least once, I think possibly twice with them, and it was an extraordinary experience. Um, and yeah, they were wonderful to work with, weren't they? They were so um, nice, so patient, and they can make anything. If you want anything cast, Beautiful job. Um, they have a specialist also in patination who can produce every rainbow colour on bronze and some beautiful painterly uh, effects. He's called Adam Padden. So if you want an interesting patina for your work, have a word with Adam. Yes, seconded. Um, Kathy has asked, um, one of the amulets you showed was a woman's profile with a long, big nose um, and is asking why you chose that particular symbol and is it to do with witchcraft? Now, let me zoom back and find it. That must have been on the table of amulets. Is it here? Mm -hmm. Is it the one that's next to my signature at the bottom of the sculpture? It's this one, isn't it? Potentially. <laughs> let's um let's assume it's that. Why don't you tell us about that one? <laughs> I gladly will. It's I was also at the same time doing some work with uh, Reading University. They have a wonderful art collection and a huge drawings collection. Um, and their curator Naomi had written, I think as part of her PhD, um about a very obscure, very interesting um, let me think. It's a piece of writing and it's a piece of writing for the 18th century. If, if the questioner wants to just drop me an email at some point, I can send them the actual material and the uh, references. Um, and because Naomi and I were working together closely and we're friends, you know, we're friends. Uh, I asked her if she'd like to choose an amulet to go on the skirt and she chose this um, strange cartoon of the extremely large nose. Um, as a, as a tribute to this work that she wrote her PhD upon. And it's funny that you choose that one to ask about because it's one of the few amulets on there that is slightly indecent. I remember that the, the old writing is drawing a connection between the size of a person's nose and particularly the idea that one might have a wart upon it and the size of their virile member. I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, I think... Uh any of these amulets would bring out a brilliant story, which is one of the, the real richnesses of the um, of the piece. I'm jumping around the questions slightly because I'm yes. conscious of time. Um, so there's one here um, from S. Bowyer saying, um, could you talk a bit about how you find your original university discipline blue, uh, excuse me, bleeding through, good uh, metaphor there, um, in your work? And is it still affecting your practice? Which is a good question. It is, and it does. Um, I used to be in Oxford and um, they had a collection of casts in the Ashmolean Museum. If you ever go there, go to the cast gallery downstairs at the back, which is really the history of ancient Greek sculpture from pre-classical to late classical. Uh, and it's interesting to have all of art history in front of you for that period, actually in three dimensions. I uh, spent an awful lot of time down there drawing, studying poses, studying how realism and anatomy, for some reason I can't understand, suddenly became important to artists in that period and in that geographical location. Um, 
And it was, it was really like following an anatomy history lesson of what they understood. There's a, a book by Guy Metro called Ancient Greek Sculptors and Physicians, I think it's called. Uh, his name is spelt M-E-T-R-A-U-X. And it discusses how much Greek sculptors would have known about anatomy and how much uh, inter uh, discourse there was between surgeons and uh, sculptors. It's pretty instructive. You know, they knew a lot. They knew more than you'd think. Um, and a lot of the uh, beliefs about the body and the spirit, particularly of heroes, athletes, particularly when you talk about the male figure, a lot of anatomical signs were also taken for moral qualities. Uh, and I think this double interest in, you know, the, the ensouled body, the ensouled object, and also the idea of a statue that has a kind of agency and could almost be considered, you know, sort of entity because of everything people invest into it has really stayed with me after all these years of studying it. And I think that is the perfect idea to end on because we have already come come to the end of our time for discussion. So, um, Eleanor, I don't know if you want to quickly just nip on. I know you've got a slide that tells people how to find out more about your work because I'm conscious we were going to talk about some of your new projects, which we've not had time for. Um, and I'm also just putting in the chat for everybody a link to um, a journal article which um, feeds on um, uh, elements of this conversation Eleanor and I have had goes into more detail about some of her work um, and also some of the other commissions in the medicine galleries. Um, do uh, look up Eleanor on these various platforms and, and find out more. I can highly recommend her Instagram for seeing um, what she's doing. Um, and please do visit us at the Science Museum. We are open Wednesday to Sunday every um, um, every week during the school terms and every day um, during the school holidays and we would love you to come and visit the medicine galleries and engage with this extraordinary commission and others in the gallery and um, all it leaves for me to do now is to say thank you for coming um, please do um, join the rest of the festival I know there are some wonderful events happening and um, yeah we hope you'll uh, join us for more events at the museum or Eleanor for more work um, for future opportunities. So thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks all very much. Thank you.